Good evening uh, to those of you in Indonesia. Good morning to some of us who are here stateside. Uh, and welcome to our first virtual town hall. Uh, I am Bill Watson Canning. I am the President of University Consultants of America. Um, this is actually sort of exciting for us because, uh, as you might know, we're not really able to travel right now. And normally this time of year, we would be in Jakarta and Surabaya and what have you going around and, and meeting all of you. And of course we can't, uh, but uh, one thing we're able to do that we wouldn't normally be able to do is have all of these fine people uh, with us today uh, to sort of share some of the experiences. Uh, so it's not uh, me speaking to you or our, our CEO. Uh, let me uh, just introduce uh, people we have with us today. Um, I mentioned already, I'm Bill Watson Canning. I'm the president of University Consultants of America. We work with students around the world uh, to help them navigate the admissions process to English speaking schools. Uh, we've been working with students in Indonesia for three or four years, I believe, at this point. Uh, and uh, it's, it's been a wonderful relationship for us. Um, we, of course, also have uh, Bob Levine, uh, the CEO and founder of University Consultants of America. Uh, I'm not sure what order people are appearing on everybody's screen, so I'll just ask you to at least uh, wave uh, when, when, when you come up. Uh, Johnson Lee uh, is uh, he's our sort of lead, uh, I don't know exactly what your title is, Johnson, uh, but you've been representing us uh, in Indonesia uh, since the start. But Johnson is not just a representative of UCA. Uh, he's also a parent who has had a daughter already go through the admissions process. and. So I'm sure Johnson doesn't want me to mention it, has a son who's coming up on the admissions process sooner than we'd like to contemplate. Uh, we also have uh, Herman Wongso. Uh, Herman's uh, daughter uh, is uh, headed to Notre Dame uh, University in, in, in the fall uh, and, and hopefully actually headed uh, to Notre Dame University, it sounds like, uh, or the University of Notre Dame. Uh, it sounds like uh, that's a school that actually will have people on campus. Uh, Patrick uh, Tiandra uh, is a student at, uh, what's the name of that, that University of Town, Patrick? <laughs> I wonder. <laughs> Stanford University. Stanford University, yes. Uh, one that uh, I know many people have uh, heard of. Uh, uh, Patrick is, what are you, uh, headed into your junior year? Sophomore yeah, year? so I'm raising junior right now. Yeah. Uh, we have uh, Brian Sumali. Uh, Brian, tell us where you where uh, you uh, attend when you're allowed to attend. Um, I'm at UC Berkeley. You, yeah, absolutely. And uh, you as well are headed into your third year there, correct? Yeah, that's correct. And uh, Aditya uh, Rowan is uh, headed to a uh, little university in, in Massachusetts, I believe. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> what, what, what was the name of that four-year school? Harvard. I'm going to Harvard. Harvard. All right. Yeah. Yes. Uh, um, uh, so uh, wonderful to have so many uh, people with us today. Uh, housekeeping wise, uh, uh, we're going to be uh, giving everybody here sort of a chance to talk. I do encourage people to use that chat function to ask questions. Uh, I'll be monitoring that. And uh, if there's sort of specific questions, I might just answer them right there in the chat window. Uh, we'll also be saving them up for some Q&A. Uh, in a little bit, so we really want to hear from uh, from your questions. Uh, but we're also going to cut off uh, one question early on that I am sure is at the forefront of people's minds. At least if you've been if you've been looking at the news, uh, the Immigration and Customs Enforcement uh, uh, Department in the United States uh, issued some uh, uh, advice around visas or uh, directives around visas uh, for students studying in the United States this fall or earlier this week. And uh, I'm gonna hand things over to, to Bob to uh, address that quickly, because uh, we don't want, I, I know if we didn't address it now, uh, I fear about 70% of our questions might, might deal with that. So, Mr. Levine. Thank you, Bill. Oh, good to see everybody, or at least talk to everybody. Um, I did wanna give you a statement, a UCA statement on the possible visa restrictions for international students wishing to study in the US. Uh, we've been working on this since it was announced a few days ago, and it changes every day. Quite literally, it changes every day. But here's what we know. The COVID pandemic, U.S. social unrest, and the economic crises of 2020 have combined with the politics of a presidential election to substantially affect the education industry. We can expect more changes. Most recently, 
the U.S. Immigration and Customs Enforcement Agency has announced the intent to restrict visas for international students who will be studying online only. University Consultants of America works every day tracking and analyzing changes to college and graduate school admissions and as part of our effort to investigate how new policies may affect you. We do look to professionals in other fields with specific expertise. For this most recent issue, UCA spoke with Martine de Imunia, a former UCA client and an immigration lawyer who authored the book, The Investor's Guide to U.S. Immigration Law. On Tuesday, July 7, Dr. Imunia told us the following. U.S. Immigration and Customs Enforcement came out with a new directive that F-1 visas will not be issued for international students who are studying online only. However, any student who is housed on campus will likely be considered a full-time student whether they are taking the classes online or in a classroom. I have had communications with Columbia University as well as several of our local public universities here in Florida. The trend is to give first preference for campus housing to international students so they can obtain their visas. The next preference is to provide housing to students with special needs or who need accommodations if they request campus housing. And freshmen will be offered space on most campuses, even if they choose not to do so. We do not know why ICE is taking this position and we believe that lawsuits will occur and things will change. Even though each university will make its own decisions, it does appear that most international students will be able to obtain their visas and attend school on campus. That was on Tuesday. Over the last two days, lawsuits have been filed by U.S. universities against the U.S. government to challenge the immigration change. Basically, the White House is attempting to go back to the prior visa law that was changed when COVID forced our schools to close. In the first lawsuit, which was filed by Harvard and MIT, the colleges are arguing that the White House did not follow proper procedure in changing the law. They seek an injunction which would prevent the change. Based upon our reading of that lawsuit and our experience with the way U.S. courts have handled immigration and changes over the last few years, UCA believes there is a substantial chance that this new change will be stopped in the next week or so. What we have seen is an effort by U.S. colleges to create hybrid educational programs that would allow international students to study here. Most importantly, our colleges are being very vocal about their desire to educate international students. UCA has no doubt that American schools place very high value on international students. So, based upon our research, UCA's current recommendations for international students are as follows. For students just beginning their university careers or already in an American university, please stay in touch with your school and monitor their announcements daily. Although things have changed already and couldn't change again, we are very hopeful that you will be studying on campus this fall. For those students planning to enroll in the fall of 2021 or later, that would mean those who are applying now or are underclassmen in high school, we do not expect major US universities to shift to remote learning on a permanent basis. While your application season will be different from that of older students, please rest assured that the U.S. education industry wants students back on campus, and we do not expect the fall of 2021 to look anything like the fall of 2020. UCA is deeply concerned with the safety, well-being, and success of our students. Please reach out to us if you have questions. We thank you for joining our webinars, our seminars, and this town hall meeting so we can communicate the most current information and develop the best possible strategies for student success. Now, that being said, we do worry a bit about the class of 2021. There have been a lot of changes announced by the schools to the extent that a lot of the existing students will decide to take time off, take a gap year, or not attend school this year. We worry that that could make fewer spots available for the next admissions class. So I'd like to turn it back over to Bill to talk about recent announcements and changes made by each college about 
SAT, ACT, and other testing requirements. Thank you, Bob. Uh, yeah, there, uh, we, we are cursed to live in interesting times right now, uh, I suppose in many industries, but uh, in, in the education industry as well. Uh, and I, I've, I've often said that every time I log into a webinar and log off, uh, there are about eight new announcements from schools. Uh, but one of the big ones uh, that is on the forefront of people's minds is, of course, testing. Uh, standardized testing uh, in the form of the SAT, uh, also the ACT. Uh, these are tests that are traditionally heavily used uh, by U.S. universities. Uh, in fact, one thing that we often find uh, with our students in Indonesia is that we need to uh, encourage you even more so uh, than students in, in some other areas uh, to make sure you get signed up for those tests uh, promptly. Uh, the U.S. universities uh, use those tests, uh, have for years U.S. students from seventh grade on uh, are, are, are prepping for those tests. Uh, I have a daughter who I think took it for the first time uh, you know, practice uh, in seventh grade. Uh, so we do encourage people always to uh, get tutoring. Uh, we're happy to recommend tutors uh, because it really is the best way to prepare for a test. But if you've been following education news, uh, one thing you might have learned is that many schools next year are going to be test optional uh, for this upcoming application season and beyond. Uh, so let's talk about what test optional means. It does not mean test blind. It does not mean that they're going to totally ignore tests. It does not mean that if you have a 1580 on your SAT and the maximum score is 1600, that you should not bother to report that. Schools are gonna be very interested in something like that. Good news is always good news. Uh, and we are encouraging people uh, to, con to take those tests if possible. Schools have had to go test optional because of course test dates had to be canceled starting uh, in, I think, February or March internationally, and pretty much right after that uh, in the United States as well. Testing is starting back up again. Uh, I know test centers are filling up quickly, and universities are aware uh, that students are not going to be able to take in the test uh, on the same schedule that they might have otherwise hoped for, uh, with the same frequency that they might have otherwise hoped for. Uh, you know, we, we don't like it when students uh, take a test four or five times, uh, but that's not even an option uh, this year. Uh, so universities are certainly aware of that. Uh, but if you are, uh, if, if, if you're looking to enroll uh, in a university in the fall of 2021, uh, we really do still encourage you to take the test. If you are encouraging, if you are uh, looking at university beyond the fall of 2021, so fall 22, 23, what have you, uh, definitely plan to take the test. Um, one of those tests, uh, probably the SAT. Uh, most schools, well, we will see. We will see what happens. Uh, there will be schools that determine uh, they don't want to go back to requiring the test. Uh, the University of California system, so uh, where Brian is, has already announced that uh, they're going to be test optional through at least, I believe, 2024 and, and probably beyond that as well. Uh, but again, uh, even in that situation, if you are sitting on a great test score, that's good news. So go ahead and try and get that great test score. Uh, now, if you are a student who uh, has a test score that does not match the rest of your profile, and uh, Herman's daughter Kelly, uh, I think, was exactly in that situation. Uh, Kelly was an outstanding candidate, and the test score just wasn't quite as outstanding as the rest of her profile. And she was able to apply to test optional schools last year. And as we mentioned earlier, she achieved the University of Notre Dame and uh, several other uh, terrific schools as well. Uh, so it can absolutely work as a strategy for you to go test optional. Uh, but uh, at this point in the season, those tests can help. Uh, but testing is not uh, the end of the story, of course. Uh, the flip side is uh, that U.S. universities' admissions are nonlinear. Uh, I am not going to uh, make anybody on this call reveal their test scores, uh, but I can tell you that uh, you know, uh, some of the people on this call uh, are at schools uh, where students with higher test scores have not achieved those schools. Uh, and uh, for those purposes, uh, before we hand things over to our panel, uh, I think Bob is going. To, uh, Bob is well suited to address what it is that U.S. schools actually look at uh, when they're evaluating candidates. Mr. Levine. Thank you, Bill. And I do want to underscore something that Bill said. We've been working in Indonesia for a few years. There is an Indonesian culture that starts taking these tests, SAT and ACT, much later than everybody else. And I know that Johnson 
can definitely reinforce this. We see way too many of you trying to get high test scores at the very last minute. Uh, the rest of the world is ahead of you. So to the extent that the American universities have said, you don't need to take SAT. It is an opportunity for you to impress them. Take the test, prepare for the test, get your best possible score, and then we decide if it is right for you. What we see too much are kids with low grades being really excited about not having to take a test. Then they're just gonna focus on your low grades. You need to impress them somewhere. So please, look away a little bit from all the stuff you hear. You don't need to. No, you don't need to, but you probably want to. Which brings me to kind of an opposite point of view. Around the world, admissions to universities is done in a very different way than is done in the US. In most places, your grades in school and perhaps your test scores will be the primary, if not sole basis for the way they accept you. We see this everywhere. So you are very used to that ideal, higher works, higher is better. And as Bill said, it is not a linear kind of numbers-based method in the United States. Our major public universities do tend to rely upon grades and test scores. Each of our states tends to rely on one more than the other. For example, in Florida, we tend to like high test scores with grades that match. In Georgia, they like high grades with test scores that match. But at most of our schools, it's not just about the numbers particularly at our best schools, our private schools, they want to look at the entire person. Why? They're looking to have an environment that teaches students 24-7, 365 for almost four years. And it is what happens outside the classroom that is quantitatively and qualitatively more important. It's not just about your qualifications. It's about your contribution. Are you a contributor? Are you a catalyst? Or are you a cancer? So they look at the whole person. And it's a holistic method, starts with an H. Holistic is what it's called. And in simple terms, what they'll do is they'll look at your academics and give a number grade. They will also look at your extracurricular or co-curricular activities or anything you do that's not brain-based. And they'll actually give you a number grade for that too. And then they look at you as a human being. Are you a good person, a contributor? Are you driven? How are you in a group? And they quite literally will give you a number grade based upon what they think of you. But how do they know about you? Because that's not in your grades, it's not in your test scores, it is not in your resume of activities. The way they know about you is in all those other things that America is famous for. Essays, teacher recommendations, counselor reports, interview reports. Those are relatively soft things, very subjective, and they are the ones that make the difference. Patrick School Stanford rejects 90% of the perfect test scores. Why? They look at everything else. Stanford has 12 essays, at least two recommendation letters, a report from your school, plus an interview. After someone reads 16 written subjective pieces about whether you are good or eh, you know, those grades and test scores aren't that exciting. Why? Because they quite literally have more than double the number of applicants with perfect scores than they can fit. And so they're not choosing you based upon numbers. They're choosing you based upon you. And this is where all that other stuff comes in handy. But ultimately, everybody wants to know, well, what test scores do I need? It doesn't really work like that. Let me give you the better question to ask. What kind of people get into the best schools? The people who get into America's best universities are people we call doers. They just naturally do things. They are not told to complete a resume. They are not forced by a tiger mom or a helicopter parent to do their extracurriculars. They just do things and the resume develops naturally. So there's a dynamic within the household between parents, and student and all the environment the student is in, you kind of need to take the training wheels off the bicycle and let them ride. I've compared this with consultants all over the world. 
Anybody can come up with a brilliant plan for an exciting resume, but the only people who tend to do those plans and follow those plans are the ones who are already moving, the doers, those who are self-motivated. In fact, Patrick did a, a webinar with us about a year or so ago, and I asked him to give advice to his high school. And I don't know if he remembers, but what he said was, yeah, don't listen to your parents. None of the kids at Stanford do things because they're supposed to do what you love. But I want you to understand that is a very, very, very different method, the way we evaluate students in the US, because we have a different way of looking at education. So um, that holistic method, it's really hard to predict. There are never guarantees. We've had students with perfect test scores not get into top schools, but get into other top schools. So when working with any consultant, particularly when working at UCA, please keep an open mind. There's a lot of things you haven't seen and we work with it every day, but yeah, not linear. Take the tests, get the best scores, but it's much more than that. So Bill, I was wondering uh, if we're getting any questions from the audience. I do encourage everybody to go to the bottom of the screen. There's a chat uh, and go ahead and in there and give us your questions. What do we got, Bill? Uh, uh, we did have a question about subject tests. Uh, I would, uh, I'll, I'll just, uh, I, I forgot to address the subject test question uh, when I was uh, speaking about testing earlier. Uh, for those of you who aren't uh, aware, subject tests uh, test your ability to go deeply into, guess what, a subject. Uh, the SAT is going to test your general knowledge, uh, your general ability for sort of reading and math. Uh, every school wants to make sure, even if you were going to be an English major, uh, I was an English major, uh, that you can at least uh, work with numbers with some proficiency and you know, vice versa for, for other majors. Uh, but uh, with subject tests, you're choosing specific areas that you want to go deeply into, which guess what, is exactly what you're going to do in college. Uh, and so that is, that is the purpose of the subject test. Uh, ideally, you should still continue to try and take a couple of subject tests. Uh, most schools that care are going to be looking for two. Uh, that said, we know that the schedule is what the schedule is this year. If you can only get uh, access to a test center for one thing, get it for the SAT, you're going to need that uh, more than the subject test. Um, for those of you uh, looking for the fall of 22 to fall of 23, uh, just as you were planning, that is all the more reason to try and get your SAT done early uh, so you have time to take those subject tests. Hey, Bill. Um, um, uh, hey, Bill. Yeah, please. A question from parents. Actually, uh, given that this test SAT is an optional, let's say um, the score is not optimal, right? Maybe around low 1400 or high 1300. Do you think they should submit the score or just play along with the optional route? So here are the uh, two most common words in university admissions consulting. It depends. Uh, there, there, is, uh, there is not a one size fits all answer for that. It would of course depend on uh, where you are applying. Uh, I, I don't think Bob would disagree with me at all on that and, and what the rest of your profile looks like. Uh, so yeah. Yeah, there are over 2,000 universities. We recommend, I think, now 259 different schools for different students. They don't all look at the same thing. They don't all have the same purpose. And even for one student, we might make a different strategy for one school versus another school. Um, so it depends is absolutely the right one. And we I mean, the the concern, Bob, is the weather is going to backfire, right? Let's say you, you're aiming for Northwestern, right? Northwestern, um, uh, history, historically, they, they're looking for like high 1400 or 1500 uh, low, right? And now you're at that border. Um, you're like 1450, for example, right? Do you want to push that one and then making you look below average? Or you just, because, because it's optional now, you say, hey, you know what? Um, I did my part. I, 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 I don't want to be average student. Well, that, you know, you raise an excellent question that fits directly with the idea of the holistic process. Mm -hmm. When worrying about the test score without considering everything else, there is no good answer. If you're an Olympic gold medalist, if you win a Pulitzer Prize, if you do something incredible, if you're Malia Obama, the 1450 will be perfectly fine. 
If you have nothing else on your resume, it probably won't be. So you do your best on the test, but we need to look at everything else because that's what the schools are looking for. It is a lot more, and this is gonna sound weird, but it's a lot more like dating than you can imagine. Because in the US, here's what doesn't work if you wanna go on a date. Hi, Johnson, I'd like to go out with you. Here's my resume, what do you say? No, we look no. at much more than that. Trust me, my wife didn't pick me because of my resume. I'm not sure why she did, but I'm just saying. So when you look only at the test score, we have no answer because we need to see the entire application. In fact, our entire focus is at one moment. When they evaluate and read through the entire application from start to finish, that is the moment they make their decision. That is the moment that we are always focusing on. And it's very much like a movie or a book. Everything needs to lead to that moment when the decision is made. I uh, just want to address a couple of other uh, test issues, and then we, we do want to get to the panelists. I can see some questions are coming in for the panelists already. Um, but uh, just on the, on the subject of testing, a question came up about the TOEFL, the test of English as a foreign language. Please just take it. Uh, it is not uh, designed to uh, figure out if you can uh, work with the English language at the level of James Joyce or somebody. It's just making sure that you're fluent. Uh, if you are fluent, you're going to be fine and you don't want to be in a situation where some university raises the question. Um, it never had a student where it was an issue. Uh, coming from an English speaking school anyway, um, but we have had students where they've suddenly had to scramble at the last second to get a TOEFL score and just don't be in that situation. If you can um, understand today's webinar, you'll be fine, but take it because if a school needs to check a box and you don't have it, you will scramble. Yeah. Uh, there's a question coming in about is there a point of diminishing returns with regard to standardized test scores? Yes, of course there is. Uh, that's why Bob mentioned uh, that uh, you know, Stanford rejects a lot of 1600s. If you're sitting on a 1590, don't take it again to get a 1600. It doesn't, it doesn't get you any advantage. Um, you know, sort of, sort of rule of thumb is uh, if you're above 1550, every school in the world is going to consider you. Uh, you know, but it also depends, as I said, uh, it depends, it depends on the school and what have you. Uh, get, get a score that represents you well uh, and then uh, move on to all the other parts of the application. Um, do universities consider SAT scores to be more important than IB scores? Bob, would you like to talk about IB scores and maybe even the predicted IB score? Yeah, let's, let's first talk about predicted IB score. That's a very popular thing in most of the world. We have IB schools all around where our office is here in Florida. I never heard about predicted IB until we went to Indonesia. It's really not a thing here. It's a, it's a concept that was created because the way international schools evaluate students in terms of grade point averages, but more importantly, in class rank and the like, there's just not as much opportunity to identify where the student fits within the class. So they came up with this idea of predicted IB scores. In most cases, it's really not that critical. They would much rather see a real score than a guess, and predicted IB is a guess. And strangely, what we have seen within Jakarta, at least, is that many of the schools will give students low predicted IB scores to kind of push them as to when the school, the high school, wants the student to apply. So predicted IB, not really a thing. IB scores in an individual class are just basically your grades. The final IB score, you've already been selected. Mm -hmm. Pretty much try not to go 10 points below your predicted and it should be okay. It's a little different in the UK. Now we do work at any English speaking school, whether it's UK, US, Canada, Australia mate, or Hong Kong U or Switzerland, doesn't matter. In the UK, if you bomb your final IB score, that could be a problem. In the US, we've not seen it a problem. In fact, there's a school in Jakarta uh, where a couple of years ago, a boy really did have a bad uh, IB, final IB score. And he already gotten into UCLA and UCLA asked the school to explain it. And they said, there is no explanation. He still went to UCLA, but in the evaluation process, most definitely they're going to be looking at the SAT because that's a universal across the board factor that allows them to compare and contrast. 
Hey, Bob, speaking of the high SAT, right? We, I think I remember this year we have few students. Um, in fact, one of them is perfect 1600 and got rejected by Berkeley and UCLA. Yeah. No? But, he, but he's also got into Northwestern and Rice. So right. this is why that nonlinear thing, you're like, what? I know Patrick went through that. Patrick went through. Patrick, tell him your story about the uh, nonlinearity of the results. <laughs> Which part of it, Bob? The part where you found out that you got a great scholarship to one UC school, didn't get in another, got into Berkeley, got rejected by USC, got into Northwestern, and got into Sanford. Yeah. D just generally, you want me to talk about that? No, I think I already did. Why don't okay, we move on? I think now <laughs> would be yeah. a great time yeah, to we're, we're, go to the parents. And we're getting a lot of questions about projects and essays and what have you that I think may be addressed in, in, in some of the uh, back and forth that we'll have now. Uh, but yeah, let's, uh, we, we are fortunate enough to have some parents uh, on the call. Um, Herman, why don't I throw it over to you uh, as a parent who has uh, just been through this journey and uh, will be sending your daughter uh, in, into the uh, first year class uh, any week now. Uh, uh, sort of looking back, what do you think some of the most important decisions were for, for you in that, in that process? Uh, but uh, any specific thing that uh, you would like to know? Uh, You've been through the process. What do you wish you uh, do then okay. uh, you know now? Okay, uh, I think the, the test optional is a good news for the most of the students. I think it's a win-win solution uh, for all. Basically, uh, if you are not confident about your score, then you can, uh, yeah, I mean, you have, if you're confident about your score, then you can just go ahead and submit it. And the university will take it and then it will be your advantage. But if you're not confident, then you don't have to submit it. And the university will not take a look at it. And they will uh, take a look about other, any, anything else, like your academic, your essay, your extracurricular, your projects, uh, your teacher recommendation, and then the interview. So basically it's a holistic process, not just your academic, uh, in my daughter's case, uh, Kelly is not, uh, uh, in one, one way, she's not uh, confident about her SAT score uh, when she applies to a uh, university, uh, especially University of Notre Dame. And that uh, last year, uh, Notre Dame is a test optional for IB student. So, uh, so she go ahead, uh, not submitting the SAT score, and, uh, but she submit everything else. Uh, and then the, the university evaluate uh, holistically, and holistically she qualified. Uh, she uh, basically got accepted to Notre Dame. Uh, she uh, in in honor program and get a, a research grant for a two semester. And she got the uh, Emory too, right, Herman? Yes, Emory, Emory too. Yes. And uh, Imperial in UK, if I remember correctly. Yeah. Yes. Correct. I mean, what was it like as the parent? Uh, clearly, you raised a very bright and accomplished daughter, but the admissions process itself, what, what did Kelly go through and what did you have to go through as okay. the parent as a supporter? I think uh, college application time is, uh, it could be a very stressful moment for, the, for our kids. And uh, it's my, my job to make sure that uh, she will remain calm and comfortable in doing this application. Uh, and what we should do is that we provide the, our best support to them, uh, like uh, given the space as much as possible, give them time and all the resources that uh, they need as much as we can. And then my 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 job is I will just stay uh, on the sideline and watch them uh, do their job, they perform their job, do their test, and then we let them know that if you have a problem. You just can come to us and talk to us, or you, if 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 uh, you are uh, you don't uh, feel like to talk to your parents, then you can go talk to uh, Bob and Bill in this case, and uh, normally they will uh, listen and they will uh, help you in one of the cases. You know, we hear and that all the time. Uh, we yes. hear it all the time from parents. The best thing was I didn't have to deal with my kid. It sounds like what you're okay. saying is. The best thing for the kid is that you don't deal with the kid because I were there times when you just had to walk away from Kelly for days. Yes, but uh, in, in one way that uh, we still we still watch over them, but uh, just pretending that we don't know anything, but we know we know everything. Yeah, that's, uh, that's what we do. Yeah, 
What about you, Johnson? Um, you've been the father of a whole bunch of Indonesian students, if you will, plus you uh, went through it with Caitlin, uh, which was a really different experience. What have you learned through all this about what it's like from the parents' perspective and what really helps the students? Um, I can attest from my experience. Um, the first two years when we worked with our Indonesian students, I was I was not a parent, right? Because um, I worked as a counselor, you know, as a ears and mouth for the parents. Um, but it gives me a way to observe the process, right? When you observe, you learn a lot. But when you actually experience it, sometimes it's totally different. You know, you get all this pressure because this is your own daughter versus somebody else's daughter. Um, in a way, sometimes it's easier because I know my, my daughter uh, better than anybody else. But at the same time, um, I cannot really push her, right? Because as a parent, when you push your kids, sometimes they tend to back off. So um, I always tell parents, there are three types of parents in this process. Number one is of parents who are too busy with their job, right? They don't have to plan for kids and they just don't have energy afterwards. Uh, number two type of parent is the parents who have no clue. Uh, they just need some help because number one, they never, they never study in the U.S. And number two is uh, this whole admission process is always changing and they cannot keep up with it. Uh, number three is actually a lot more common in Indonesia where the parents are, have the high expectation, right? Ivy, 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 or Stanford, MIT, you know, uh, and they, they know they need an expert to help them to get, to guide their kids to the, to the Ivy schools. For me, um, I'm a parent number four, okay? What I mean is I'm trying to avoid conflicts, okay? Uh, there are many times, because I know my daughters, right? We have a similar personality. Uh, which I did a lot when I, when I grew up with my mom. When I say A, when my mom say A, you know what, I'm gonna say B. You know, if, you say, if, if my mom say B, I will say A. It's just, there is always this conflict internally. I don't know why, but I just like to do it for my parents. And I see that in my daughters. Um, so by having an outside uh, a counselors, it helped me to avoid these conflicts. A very simple, you know, when, when I ask my daughters to start with SAT, she says, okay, but you know what? She's not gonna do it because she doesn't wanna do it. But when the counselor told her, well, I think it's time for you to start SAT. Guess what? She asked me to buy her the books. I don't have to do anything. I don't well, have to wait waste anything. Let's be fair here, Johnson. You didn't buy her books. You bought her six books for her 16th birthday and she liked it. She liked it. That's right. It's, it's, it's well worth the money to spend, right? And I don't have to yell at her, right? Um, and number one, another important thing when I experience is in the family between mom and dad, you got to have one voice, okay? There are many times when I said one thing and then my wife says another thing. Guess what? She says, I don't have to listen to both of you. But if both parents representing one voice, because we all want the best thing for our kids, right? Um, and I think it's gonna, the whole process is going to work much better. I mean, it's, it's one team person, right? I mean, uh, among the clients, uh, I mean, parents, counselors, uh, teachers, Bob, we are one team. So we, we try to achieve one goal. But the process could be all over, right? You could you have a choice to create a stressful environment or you can create a very, you know, calm, relaxed, fun. I mean, like if you ask Patrick or Brian or Aditya, they're going to tell you it's been fun, you know, but if you ask, if you ask several other clients, they're going to say, geez, I, I'm glad I only have one child, you know? So, you know, it's, it's a process. Uh, and I can tell you, unless you experience this, you you cannot you don't know what to how you share with other parents you know it's hard it's hard right it's hard 
You know, uh, one of the things that we tell all of our people repeatedly, we have to remind ourselves, one of the first things we want to do is understand what is going on inside the client's home, how the parents interact with the students, how the parents interact with each other. If there are problems, because we need to understand the environment the student is in. And that also means we need to understand the parents uh, as much as possible. I think, I think, I think it, that's exactly, you know, the, the, the chemistry in the family is very important, right? Uh, when, when I came from, when, when I come home and, and I see Caitlin sitting on the couch, you know, trying to do her essay, I just keep watching her. What are you doing? Right. And then a, two hours later, I see, I saw her screen still blank, you know, and I just said, you need help? Guess what? She said, no, I don't need your help. And the truth is this, Johnson felt like Caitlin wasn't doing her work. From what we were seeing, she was ahead of everybody else. That just shows you how hard it is as a parent. But I kind of want to hear from some of the students about what it's like to be the student in dealing with their parents. So, Bill, who should we start with? Should we start with Patrick? Uh, yeah, let's go to Pat Patrick. Uh, uh, to tell us a little bit about your experience uh, going through the process that I'm sure you are glad to have behind you. Yeah, yeah, no, definitely. You know, just coming back to the parents, I think. Um, first off, you know, what Bob said a year ago, I made this vid, I, I think two years ago, no, a year and a half ago, probably. I made this video where one of my advices was don't listen to your parents. So I guess I want to talk more about that because I feel like it's not entirely true. Definitely, you know, being from what Fahirman said and what Johnson said, you know, this process is just as much about the parents as it is the students, you know, as much as we're the ones applying to colleges, you know, there is, there is a lot of involvement from parents. So a little bit of background on my story, you know, when I was applying to Stanford, I was applying regular decision. And, you know, there's this whole rumors about, you know, which gets accepted more to like regular decision and like early admission. And I, I don't know really the statistics, but generally Stanford does not accept a lot of people. You know, it's either one or two, maybe three a year if they're crazy outstanding applicants that year. So my story was this, um, my high school before that, before me and Devin, got into Stanford, didn't have anyone who got into, got one person to Ivy, but no one before has gone to Stanford. You know, we're not just, or we're not BIS, or we're not SPH, you know, we're not that well known yet. So when Devin got in early decision, you know, it was, it seemed like my chances to get in was very low. So my mom at the time, you know, she was what I call a very realistic parent, which first of all, I thank her so much for it, because I think because of that realism, I got into so many other great schools. And as what Bob says, you know, the college process is very, what we call nonlinear. So just because you have great scores, great activities, doesn't mean that you're going to get it. There's never a guarantee to get in these colleges. You know, I got into UC Berkeley, I didn't get into UCLA, and I got a great scholarship from UC Davis, you know? So my mom was just saying like, you know what, Patrick, it's going to be very hard to get Stanford. And since someone already got into Stanford from your high school, you know, the chances of you getting it's even lower. So she told me back then, you know, Patrick, if you don't have time, don't even bother applying to Stanford, you know, focus on these other schools where you have a big chance, which is totally fair, you know, which is totally fair. So I completed all my applications by the 28th of December. I think Princeton was my last essay. And I thought I was done. I was, you know, thank God it's been a year since you know, this whole tumultuous process has started. I am done. I put down my laptop. I closed it. You know, it was New Year's and my family was over in Jakarta from Surabaya. And I just like wanted to spend time with them. And on the 29th of December, you know, I just was sitting in my room. I was sleeping in my sister's room, actually, at that time. And I was thinking to myself, you know, Stanford. Stanford's application is still open. And this has been a school that I have been dreaming of for so long. But I only had two days to write applications. And as what Bob said, Stanford has the most essays. So I tried 12 essays in the span of two days. And the one question that was in my mind the whole time, you know, and something I would like to talk about more later is the success mindset. And that question was, you know, hey, Patrick, Stanford has been your dream school for so long. You know, will you regret it if your whole life, you know, you just maybe that there was a chance that you would get into Stanford? That was the question that was in my mind. Will I regret this decision? You know, and I realized that I will regret this decision if I didn't apply, you know, because might as well just put myself out there. If they reject me, they reject me. If they accept me, like, great. So in the span of two days, two nights, I wrote my Stanford application, 
My mom didn't know about this. My sister didn't know about this. My dad didn't know about this. until, of course, I had to use their credit card to send in my application. So what I'm trying to say with, with my advice to the parents specifically, you know, and these has been touched by Johnson and Paherman, is that striking a balance during this process is very important, you know. On one side, you have parents who are crazily optimistic, you know. Their kids maybe have not done a lot of activities, maybe didn't get the best test scores, but they expect great results, you know, and that's obviously not feasible. And on the other side, you have parents who are, you know, overly negative. Parents who said, okay, maybe you're not gonna get in, you know, maybe you're, you're not good enough and things like that. And for students, it's quite hard because in my, in, for example, in my process, you know, I had someone that I don't even talk to tell my other friend that she or he hopes that I get rejected to all my colleges, you know? So as much as you would like to think everyone is collaborative and everyone is going to make, support you in this college decision process, that's not the truth, sadly. You know, it's a competition and everyone wants to win at the end of the day. So I guess as parents, you know, just striking this balance between, oh, when do you give time to your kids? You know, when do you support your kids? When do you tell your kids, maybe this is not the right decision? That's an important role during, that's an important role of a parent during this process. Now on the other side, you know, on, for example, my advice to students is that this college decision, like this college application process is very, very hard. You know, you're in your senior year, you're doing your mock exams, you're studying for IBs or APs, you're doing your SATs and all those things. And it's very overwhelming, you know, and this is where what Bob said about self-motivation comes into place a lot, you know, and the success mindset. So I guess my advice for a lot of you that are out there who are, you know, questioning if you don't have good enough test scores, if you think your friend got in and like you're comparing yourself, please keep in mind that this college process, the application process and the decision process is really nonlinear. You will never know until you take that risk, until you take that step to apply to this college. And as you go through the process, you know, there's a lot of times where you will doubt yourself. There are a lot of times when you will say you were not good enough, but ask yourself this one question. If you don't do this, for example, if you don't take the SATs, if you don't study hard enough for the SATs, if you don't apply to a college, if you're not writing this essay in your voice and in someone else's voice, will you go your whole life regretting that? Yeah, I guess and, you know, one of the, as a professional, uh, I have to say, don't start your essays on December 29th. <laughs> <laughs> but the success mindset that Patrick's talking about is kind of the reverse of avoiding a feeling of possible failure. See, because Patrick didn't really think it would happen and he was being realistic and it was the last minute, he didn't have much time to do those essays and he just let them rip. He just let go. Uh, we see it all the time. If you're in a good mood, you do better writing. We actually want you to take the understanding or at least the perspective. I can't get in. It's impossible. Take that perspective because then all we have to do is do the impossible. And Patrick will tell you his best work was when he was loose and relaxed, not trying to write the perfect essay. Am I right? Yeah. There's also, no perfect essay, right, Bob? I, I would also point out that Patrick had been writing essays uh, all fall, so that by the time he cracked open those 12 Stanford essays, he'd seen an activities essay before. He'd seen a, uh, the, the, you know, some of the various essay types. Well, I'll go further than that. Uh, he used some of the essays already did, so you didn't write 12 essays. That's, that's true. <laughs> I wrote 10, I think. Maybe. Fair enough. What about you, Brian? What's, what was life like for you uh, oh. in the process and then at Berkeley? Well, I think my mom is um, my mom is the cheerleader. She, um, I, I, I remember I, came, I come from a pretty small school in Jakarta. Um, I think that one or two people got into Berkeley. Um, and then I wasn't the top of my class. My grades were A minuses, B pluses. Um, so I thought that it, it was realistic. There were a few tiger moms in my batch. Um, and then they were like, oh my God, I'm an American citizen. I'm going to get into Berkeley. I'm going to get into USC because it's my safe school. Um, and I had neither of those qualities. I'm not American. Um, I didn't have good grades. I didn't have good activities. So my mom was, um, I was considering um, Southeast Asian schools um, at that time. And then my mom gave me this mindset that, hey, you know what? If you apply, um, no, if you apply, if you, t um, if you got in, you beat the odds, you prove everybody wrong. Um, if you didn't get in, well, 
the, it's their loss, right? I mean, um, so I think my mom was the primary motivator. Um, in 11th grade, I, um, I picked myself up. Um, I started taking my academics much more seriously. Um, I did things that I actually liked, not things that would um, be a resume item. Um, so I did a lot of unconventional things. Um, and then I continued through college. I think that um, that was when it kind of changed a little. My mom was the driving force. Um, and it came to, when it came to um, choosing majors, she was also the driving force behind it, um, which is not necessarily what I like. So I think that um, tying it back to what Patrick um, was bringing, uh, was talking about, um, you are you are as parents the, cheer, the primary cheerleaders. Nobody believes in your child more than you believe in your child. Even your child doesn't believe in yourself sometimes. But also, it's important to strike a balance between um, between realism and optimism. I feel you were talking about majors. Um, you are an economics major. By the way, for those who don't know, Brian uh, will be starting at the uh, High School of Business within Berkeley, which means he did really well. Uh, and I think you're also a, a teaching assistant for one of your professors. Yeah. We're, we're quite proud of him. But, but what's, you know, particularly in Indonesia, there, well, everywhere, there are certain things that t tend to repeat. In America, there are certain majors and career directions that are very popular. In India, there are different ones. In Indonesia, we see a lot of comp sci, we see a lot of economics. Brian, you went the economics route. How has that worked out? And how does the choice of major affect your performance and your future opportunities? Well, I think I'll start with asking people to think about a major that you have or what do you think your child might want to have or what you had in college, um, what major you might have. So I have this list here. Um, in 10th grade, I was financial engineering. In 12th grade, I was industrial engineering. And then in the first year, I was, I had a, I, had a, I don't know where I was going. I was psychology, rhetoric, English, quant econ, and then business. And then um, second year, second semester, second year, I took a really cool class. I'm in global studies. And then just a few days, just a few days ago, I asked Bob, hey, Bob, should I go for a JD, which is a law degree? So I think that it shows from experience that um, what, you what you're going to take in your AP, I, I think that your AP, IB, A level is going to build up to um, what you're going to um, choose in. I think that's a common perception, um, where what you take in high school is going to be um, what you're going to choose um, in university. That's simply not true. I think that I know a lot of people um, for two years, I think they change a lot like I, what I did. Um, and your major is going to change a lot in college. I think um, my mentor at Berkeley, um, his name is Dan Mulhern. Um, he taught, he, he read religion at Yale and then he taught religion and then he went to politics and then he taught business. So I think that um, a lot of um, what we're going to take, we're, we think that um, in Indonesia, um, your major is going to be um, your is going to be a path that you're going to take for the rest of your life. Um, I think that um, switching majors in Indonesia um, can be a hassle, um, and in, this is true in the UK, Hong Kong as well, um, which is why there's this mindset in the US uh, when applying to US admissions that um, you have to get this right, you have to get the major that you like. I think that interests change um, when you go to college. For example, your mom isn't breathing down your back. Um, when you're choosing something. And then you can actually take classes that you actually like, not something that makes the most money. Um, so I think that a lot of those factors um, come into play. Um, for students, um, I think it's important to talk to um, your parents about what you're gonna take um, and go over it with them, um, make sure that they're okay with it and then go over the pros and cons. I think it's important to have that um, conversation and that open openness to experiences. You know, you, you bring up a, an interesting point, and, and you're in a, in a UK, or in a UK style secondary school, which is a different method than the American style high school. Um, the American universities don't expect that you know what you want to do for the rest of your life when you get there. In many cases, if not most, our schools uh, don't require that you pick a major until you're halfway done after two years. But there is this perception, I got to know, I got to know what I'm going to do because you're going to college to get a job. Uh, Brian, it sounds like your point of view is it's really kind of hard to know and maybe impossible. I'm wondering from Patrick. Patrick, would you recommend that somebody be sure and certain about their life path before they even apply to a school? Yeah, I think that's a great question. You know, and I think for a lot of people, especially coming from Indonesia, you know, that was the set mindset. Because for me, it was that as well. Like my dad was wanted to be a, me a mechanical engineer for forever, and my sister 
you know, since I was 10 years old, would steal my Legos to make it by like Legos that I got for my birthday to make for herself because she also wanted to be a mechanical engineer. And they're both right now mechanical engineers. So I applied to Stanford as a chemistry degree, actually, because I feel like back in Indonesia, you know, we're not exposed to a lot of these career paths. You know, and that's why like coming to America is just very mind opening, you know, it's like bioengineering is a thing. And I didn't know back then. I wanted to be a chemical engineer back then because I thought I could do stuff with food. And it turns out, you know, we just have such a skewed pers perspective of what these majors are because we're just not exposed as much to it. And we feel that success is really tied into, you know, having this 100 year plan of what you're going to do at every single step of your life. And that's not true. Because once you're in the United States or once you're in college, you get exposed to so many different things that we just have never learned in our life yet. So coming back to Bob's question of, you know, should you have a set route? Should you have a set path, you know, to succeed in life? You know, that's never true. And this is what if anybody at Stanford ever asked you uh, about that chemical engineering thing, you checked on the <laughs> box when you were applying. Yeah, so actually, I didn't even apply as a chemical engineer. I applied as a chemistry major. Sorry, it's a, uh, yeah, it's a, well, there you go. Yeah, so they come well, and knock on your door in the middle of the night. Why aren't you studying chemistry? <laughs> yeah, so it was kind of crazy because, you know, as a freshman, especially, I think coming into college, you know, we have almost a desire to, you know, excel at everything. Like, it's almost a desire to prove ourselves. And I was taking a very advanced, like, chemistry class because I got IB credits for it on the first quarter and everyone in my dorm was like, hey, Patrick, you're crazy for taking this in fall quarter. And they were right. You know, I was trying to be almost someone that I wasn't. I was trying to prove myself, you know, when I really didn't have to. And a lot of times, you know, when you're trying to be an overachiever, especially at the first um, quarter, first semester in college, you know, you get into so many different issues with like, adapting to the environment and being stressed currently and making friends, you know, it's very overwhelming. So yes, I have been asked a lot of times about my chemistry um, major because I did take that one very hard class in the first semester of college. And then change your mind. Yeah, I hard changed my mind after that. No, literally, the university is not going to hold you to it. <laughs> in fact, this is a land of opportunity. This is a reason many people come to the U.S. to find things that are not available in your home country, which makes me wonder what uh, Mr. Aditya is thinking about studying, since apparently he's going to get it wrong anyway. Aditya, tell us a little about your story and where are you from and what you think you're going to do in the future, because I'm pretty sure it's going to change. But nevertheless, bring it on. You know, we've got it recorded for posterity. <laughs> Thank you, Bob. So I'll, I'll, I'll tell you my story. So uh, basically in July last year, when I first wanted to start my application, I came to a local college consultant to seek advice on the application process, especially the Ivy Leagues. So, you know, I saw this like big banner that said consulting service for U.S. University. So naturally, I came into the office and they were pretty happy to greet me. And we had a, like a nice little chit chat. And then the consultant asked me, which university do you want to study in? I said, Harvard and MIT. And then the consultant looked at me like it was pretty much insane. And they asked, well, you know, what's your Tubal score? What's your SAT? What's your subject test score? At the time, I hadn't taken my SAT or Tubal, so I didn't have those scores yet. And then they asked me if I was taking IB, IB or honors or AP or were you taking uh, Cambridge A-levels? I said, no, I'm not, because I'm taking the national SMA curriculum. They also asked for my extracurricular activities, and I told them it was about hydroponics and growing plants. And then they Im immediately say, said to me, you know, in a quite polite but pitiful tone, that we don't think you can make it. Uh, you're not ready in any aspect of your application. Forget about the Ivy Leagues, Aditya. I went to a total of three local college consultants. And when those uh, consultants saw my credentials and my extracurriculars, they basically all said, forget about it. Those schools are way over your league. They're way over your, your budget because, you know, of their substantial tuition. So honestly, uh, like in late July last year, I was pretty bummed out. But I knew I still want to. I, uh, I knew I still had to apply. So I was fortunate enough to be introduced to, to UCA and, and Bob, who basically said, dude, uh, you can do it. Uh, uh, Bob and UCA saw my credentials and said, these are, these are great. UCA made me believe that I could, I could make it. And they said, uh, you're not too late and your activities are not useless. So like uh, a major misconception that I want to address, which is basically an extension to what, uh, to what Bob said earlier, is that 
people in Indonesia tend to think that there, are, uh, there is a fixed formula to admission. There tends to be a generalization in many parents and families that there are certain extracurricular activities or some sort of predetermined algorithm or set of activities that would ensure admission to the United States universities like Harvard or MIT. So consequently, parents sometimes you know, force their children to do certain extracurriculars like piano, violin, or football, or basketball. I mean, of course, if, if they are already inherently interested in those activities, then that is perfectly fine. Please explore them. But if that interest lies somewhere else, please try to refrain from uh, forcing them to do like those activities or other activities. It will actually undermine their ability to uh, pursue and focus on their passion by uh, basically imposing external influence that might actually not help at all in their college applications. Because in my case, uh, you know, my passion activity is hydroponics and uh, growing, growing plants, which actually sounds really uninteresting if you, if you say it like that. So uh, I started my hydroponic activity when, uh, six years ago when I was in seventh grade, you know, with zero intention of utilizing it for a college application. I took, off, I took care of my plants at school daily, even on weekends. I had many trials and tribulations throughout my, my hydroponic hobby and activity. But, you know, who knew from simply uh, growing lettuces and spinach that would eventually bring me to Harvard? Uh, who knew from such seemingly an important activity, I would also find my interest in biology and eventually delve into science Olympiads. Because uh, the thing is, I don't owe my admissions to the try points or the lay layups I made in the court or the Mozart's pieces uh, played on the piano. I owe it to the countless lettuces and spinach I grew and harvested. Because once again, but once again, I'm not saying that you shouldn't do these activities like sports or uh, playing the piano. But for the ones who have unconventional activities like me, as long as they are positive and we have the commitment and dedication to do them, it will work. It, it can be knitting sweaters for the homeless or opening online shops, uh, selling hype clothing or thinking and repairing phones and electronics, or perhaps doing uh, storytelling performances. So um, reciting my point, there is no single formula that will uh, guarantee admissions like Bob and Johnson said. And that is basically the beauty of uh, United States holistic admissions, just as Bob mentions. It extends beyond our grades and GPA and SAT scores on uh, what curriculum you took, uh, be it national or a IB or AP curriculum. Because having hydroponics as your hobby or extracurricular does not mean Harvard or MIT won't take you in. So, you know, uh, for parents with students who might find themselves in weird positions with seemingly useless activities, they're not out of the, they're not out of the game. They, they still stand a chance in, in you know, uh, getting admissions to Harvard or MIT. So, yeah, that's you raise an interesting point. So I'm going to ask you, Aditya, I'll ask you, Patrick, and Brian as well. Uh, the things that you just did, I know Patrick did a spirulina project, and the term project is used a lot in Jakarta, by the way, and it's way beyond the idea of a project. But Patrick did some uh, work on that, and Aditya did some work on that. Uh, for you guys, we didn't tell you to do those things. Did anybody force you to do those things? Did anybody tell you to? Not for me. Patrick? Yeah, no. And I think, you know, when I'm looking at this Q&A, like a lot of people are saying, you know, how many personal projects do we need? Like, what right. activities do we need to get into? Like, what we're trying to establish here is that is exactly what Aditya just framed his whole, you know, advice just so well. You know, he's talking about how we keep thinking that there is an algorithm, that there is a set way to get into these U.S. college admissions, you know, and it's not, that is not true at all, you know, and one of the worst mistakes with that misconception is this idea that activities can just be made up, you know, activities can be something you're forced to do, that something you don't like, because when it comes down to writing, for example, your activities essay, what are you going to write in there, you know, that's the big question sometimes, you know, and with these college admissions officers who've seen so many different, like thousands and thousands of essays in their whole life, you know, don't you think that they will be able to distinguish those who, for example, maybe was not as passionate as they were about their project to someone who was super very passionate about their project, but maybe never made it on, for example, television, you know? And I think that is a misconception that a lot of people in Indonesia have, and it's definitely a misconception that we should and I hope that me, Aditya, Brian, and all of the panelists today have disproved. Yeah, well, um, 
and, and let's be honest, uh, as anybody who knows me knows I'm sometimes too honest. The term project is used throughout as something that you should be directed towards. I kind of want you to take that term out of your vocabulary. Don't call it a project. And don't call it a passion because that word is so overused. But essentially, from the parental point of view, when your, your children find things they really like to do, support their inspiration and, you know, help them get there. Um, in the case uh, of Aditya, you started your hydroponic. How many years did you do it before you applied? Six years. Six years. When you did that, were you, did you start seventh grade thinking, this is how I'm going to start building my resume? No, no, no. I wasn't even planning to apply to United States University at that time. <laughs> you, you can't hit a checklist and hit a box and just do this. It's a very, very individual process. But what about you, Brian? Uh, what was it like from your perspective? From my perspective, um, I was overweight. Um, my family had, my family is diabetic, so I'm pretty sure I'll be next. Um, so, you know, my mom asked me to start running um, and I ran, I ran every week. Um, so I made it to nationals because I wanted to prove um, to the people running around, that, around me who are seasoned marathoners that I can beat them. So I think that that came from me. Um, that came from desire to be healthy. Uh, it's all about inspiration. It's all about desire. It's all about motivation, initiation. Uh, the young men that you're seeing today, uh, first of all, through you guys are great. We love having you for lifetime friends, but we didn't make you great. Your parents helped. It's all about you being your best. And that's what we tell people all the time. We get the question, what should my son or daughter do to get into the best schools? And my response is, what do they like to do? What should they do? I was talking to a family in Shanghai and they wanted to hire us for one reason. Can you put together the activities and the summer programs and all these things for my son so he can get into an Ivy League school? There are five things he's thinking about doing. Son, tell Mr. Bob what you're thinking about doing. He explains all five. What do you think? Which one do you like? This one? Do that. He says, see mom, see mom. And they said, we don't need any of the other things. We just need you to create the path. And I said, we don't want you as a client. This is not our job to create a false resume. It's got to be real. It's got to be authentic. So no, hire somebody else. Two weeks later, they asked again, can we pay you more money? No, 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 no. What we want is for you to understand. It is not one size fits all. It is not a pre-box thing. You don't just check boxes. As a parent, develop the best possible human being. Because if you do that, then as you can see today, you will also develop the best possible applicant. But I think it's time for some Q&A because we've got a lot of questions. Uh, Bill, where shall we start? Well, we've been, uh, uh, and, and some of these we've been addressing as we go, of course, as well. Um, but uh, the question that came up very early on was on the topic of essay topics uh, that are of interest to admissions officers. I think that each of the three of you might have already told us what your essay was about in passing. Uh, but uh, ju just so we can uh, you know, lock it in, uh, one sentence from each of you on what your personal statement was about. Um, Brian, I think you were uh, just talking about it a, a minute ago, right? Yeah. He forgot. Um, Brian wrote so many essays. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah, and the dirty little secret of admissions is there are a lot of essays beyond the main one, but uh, of, of interest are rising. 12th graders right now, I think, is that main personal statement. So, uh, Brian, what was your personal statement on? Do you remember? Well, I think I covered my um, personal statement, the one that I um, wrote at the start, but then I think I want to cover more about um, what I did for some of the schools. Um, so this personal statement was very different. Um, I'm, I'm Chinese Indonesian, so I think that essay was an, act, an activity essay. It wasn't about um, talking about, oh, I grew this plant um, in Entete, or I grew or I went to help um, somebody in Papua. No, it was about um, discovering my Indonesian identity um, and doing a lot of different tangents, um, going over a lot of different tangents that, um, that, that were key in identifying them. One of them was 
um, with um, a friend of mine um, who passed away um, a few years ago. He drove me to school every 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 day for eight years, and it became a conversation. It became um, it was about talking to him for eight years um, and um, how that shape my perspective. So I think that that essay, um, I think that a lot of people ask, what is the best essay? Yes, the best essay comes from you. I think that me, Patrick, Aditya, um, Bob, Bill, Johnson, um, we all apply to college, we all apply to U.S. colleges. Um, we all have different stories. Um, there is no single um, story that, there, there is no single um, theme that fits well. Um, I think that what fits well is what's sincere because of what Patrick said was um, how, Oh, these people have been reaching, um, have been reading applications for years. They're very seasoned. So I think that um, they're pretty, they're pretty good at telling if you can bluff or if you're, act if, or what you're writing comes from the heart. So I think um, two words, be sincere. You know, and for those who don't know Brian, um, when he wrote his essay about driving to school uh, and how much he learned in that car, um, that was the one he immediately embraced as this one's my best. This one is important to me. Um, Patrick's essay was, well, why don't you explain it, Patrick? My personal statement or? Yeah, the one where you criticize your mother's cooking. <laughs> Got it, yeah. So again, you know, just coming back to what Brian said, you know, what essays really interest these admissions officers? Essays about you. Essays about things you're interested in. You know, I feel like that's an important um, fact that we should put out there. And for me, you know, that thing was cooking. And back then, you know, I started cooking by simply my mom would cook something and I didn't really like it. You know, she used to cook vegetables a lot. I don't even know why, you know, to force myself to eat vegetables, I guess. Um, and I started off cooking because I didn't really like that. You know, I didn't like the fact that I was, every time I was hungry at night, you know, I was forced to eat vegetables. So then I started exploring, you know, after criticizing my mom's cooking, you know, how do I make the soup better, for example? You know, because my mom was, was, I think she was very healthy. She wanted us to be very healthy. You know, so a lot of things she cooked was very healthy. So after that, you know, that kind of just grew my interest in cooking. And so I talked a lot about how cooking has shaped my life and how, for example, like cooking ingredients and how they go well with each other kind of shaped my perspective on leadership, basically. Aditya, um, well, you're a champion biology Olympian. Great. And you actually wrote a story about being at the Olympics. But tell everybody what you were really writing about. The event was in the Olympia, but I didn't uh, mention anything about, you know, uh, the, the, the competition itself. The, the essay I wrote was like a pretty small event that occurred one morning before the theoretical test. So as I went down to the, to the dining hall, I saw this like one uh, small kid who was who was who seemed pretty stressed because it was like his first time uh, coming to like a, a different city or flying with an airplane uh because at the time uh the, the national competitions were in was in was in sumatra if i'm not mistaken so it was like uh his first time uh, coming out from his, his his hometown so he wasn't eating so i i know that if you want to do well in competition you have to be well fed you have to focus and you have to have a lot of energy so basically the point of my essay is uh, he, he, had, he had a plate with, with a piece of toast and an uh, industrial mayo, like the, the type of white mayo you, you would eat with um, rice or, or, or fried, fried stuff, not with bread. So I told him, like, uh, you're, you're eating mayo with, with your bread? He said, yes, isn't, isn't this jam? He didn't, he didn't even know what, what mayo was, what jam was. So I was, like, uh, kind of sorry for him. So I, I, asked, uh, I ran to the, to the dining hall. I made him, like, a Nutella bread uh, with, with chocolate jam in the middle. And I gave it to him. And we ate it. We ate, it, uh, we ate the sandwich together uh, in the bus journey to the, to the theoretical test competition place. And we had a little chat. And then uh, that's basically the, the story of my personal statement. So from the story, it doesn't have to be like a, a major or bombastic event. It can be a very, very small excerpt of your life, like a small piece, a moment that you cherish in your heart, uh, that you, you know, uh, a memory that showcases who you are as a person, like uh, Patrick and Brian said. Um, it doesn't have to be like, I won this competition because I'm so great. Through this, uh, you know, small event uh, in my personal statement, I showcase that I was, uh, I care about other people, basically. Yeah, and uh, the end of that personal statement, uh, 
Adichie wins his, his gold medal and he's looking for this new friend and the guy's not there. And that's when the philosophy comes out. It's like, look, this should be good for all of us. I think one of his greatest memories, sure, he got the medal, but he worried that his friend didn't. And that kind of shows character. Um, internally, some of us call that the mayonnaise essay. Some of us call us the Nutella sandwich essay, but all of us remember it. And when you try to do these big things, sometimes they're not as memorable uh, as some of the small things that parents are like, what? Last year we had a boy that wrote about three times being up a mountain. And mom looked at me as if, what are you doing to my brilliant son? And I said, it's okay. It's not really about the three mountains. It's about the next mountain. Uh-huh. I said, I'll tell you what, after this is all over, we're gonna go on a video chat and I'm gonna say, I told you so. And you're gonna say, Bob, you are so wise. So after he got into both Northwestern and Rice, I called and she's laughing. And I said, I told you so. Bob, you are so wise. It's not about the achievements. They are already on the resume, already in the application. It's about the person that shows through these small moments. Bill, what's another question? Uh, I've had a few questions about uh, scholarship opportunities, grant opportunities, financial aid opportunities, let's call it, for, for international students. Uh, I, I, I think a lot perked up when they heard that Patrick got a scholarship from, uh, from UC school. Um, any of you want to uh, sort of address what you've seen out there uh, before? Well, um, well, Aditya, why don't you answer that one? Because I think that fits perfectly, right? So basically, like in some schools, uh, for example, Harvard and MIT, they give out these uh, the equivalent of a scholarship in the United States version. Uh, it's called financial aids. So uh, for in Harvard and MIT's case, financial aid is proportional to the uh, financial capabilities of, of the family of how, how much you can pay. So uh, in short, the less you can pay, the more financial aid you'll receive. And the more you can pay, the less financial aid uh, you'll receive. Uh, I don't know if this works in um, other colleges, but in need blind schools like uh, Harvard, MIT, Princeton, and Yale, that's the case. Uh, that's why I applied to Harvard, MIT in the first place because they offer uh, need blind financial aids because I couldn't afford it if I don't have those uh, financial aids. So um, maybe uh, Brian and Patrick could address the uh, you know, other type of scholarships. Yeah, um, so I applied to Northeastern Early Action, it was my safety school. Um, and then I opened a decision um, January. Um, I wasn't in school that day, I was sick. And then I realized that I got a scholarship. So I think that a lot of the um, programs, they will automatically consider you for merit-based scholarships. Um, another program that I applied to was USC, um, wherein you have to apply by December the 1st um, to, apply, to, get a, to, to get a scholarship. Um, and then they come up with a decision for the scholarship. Um, they might fly you to LA for that. And then after that, um, if you're not, if you're, if you got the scholarship, I think you're in. Um, if you don't, um, they'll consider you for a regular decision. Yeah, it's, there's, the term scholarship is used too much. Uh, in America, what the universities give is actually a discount. And they call it either financial aid, which is based upon the parent's ability to pay, or merit aid, which is based upon the student, or to put it in a different way, how much the school wants the student. One of the advantages that we have with working with so many students and, and being here in the US and seeing the trends is we can see which schools are being more favorable to those who are in Indonesia uh, about giving money. We have students who are getting, as Brian said, scholarships to Northeastern, uh, to um, USC, $100,000, to Fordham University, to DePaul. We're talking six-figure tuition discounts because they're looking for you. And so when you look at the list, there are variants here. And we wanna give you the advice so you get the best cost and then can match it with the best benefit. And Patrick, in your case, didn't Davis like change the scholarship? Yeah, so Davis gave me two merit scholarships actually, one from UC Davis as a, I guess, university and one from like my specific college. Um, which was the College of Agricultural Science, I think, because I was applying for food science back then. Yeah, so basically, that, they offered him $60,000. Then he opened up an email a couple of days later. It's like, no, let's make it 80. Yeah. 
<laughs> but but I think the attitude is um, there is always a way, right? I mean, we should not let the uh, the financial things stop you from applying, because you don't have to decide when you apply. You decide on May first. I mean, uh, unfortunately for some, um, well. I'm going to share some story. Uh, last year was the first time we helped Olympians, right, Bob? Um, there, we, there were eight students apply. Eight students. They are equally as good as Aditya. They, had, they won some uh, medals. Um, and quite frankly, they have an equal chance to Harvard or MIT or Yale or Princeton. But one thing that separate between Aditya and the rest of the candidate is you know, how hard they're willing to work, right? I have two students, uh, two weeks after we told them, hey, congratulations, uh, we're gonna help you for your application. They said, you know what? My teacher told me US is too far. Singapore is closer, right? So I'm gonna pull off. And I, and I told these kids like, wow, you know, you just had an opportunity in lifetime, and now you tell me you're not gonna do it because U.S. is further than Singapore? No, right? You still and gotta get on a plane. Exactly, you still have to go to the airport and fly, right? And, and another student told me like, oh, I'm sorry, you know, my, my SAT is only 1400. I don't feel confident. It's going back to Bob, what Bob said earlier. I mean, every school is gonna value, evaluate you differently, right? There's no one should fit all. So right away, uh, the students say, I'm not confident. I'm not gonna pursue this. And this is like in the middle of the application. Can you imagine, like, I just give up three slots, right? To somebody else. I mean, there could have been somebody else that can use it, right? And then another two students told me, I'm sorry, uh, I cannot afford to buy an airline ticket to take an SAT, <laughs> you know? <laughs> because they came from a, not a big city, but they, they're from somewhere in Java or Sumatra and say, you know, my, my parents cannot afford to buy airline tickets. Well, it's, it's saddening, but again, if, if I give you a chance to apply to Harvard or MIT, right? I think it's another kind of opportunity. Well, guess what? I mean, we show it, it can be done. Um, Aditya is not from IB school, a, uh, AP school or Cambridge. He's from national school, you know? And, and, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm, we're very proud. Why? Because we show the world then, hey, everybody has equal chance as long as you put an effort, right? Uh, there, there are many hours, you know, between Bob and, and the detail. You, they just like friends. In the same time, I always answer the question from the parents because the parents has no clue, you know? All my job is just trying to uh, calm them down, you know, give them confidence. Hey, you have to believe in your son, right? Because if you don't believe in your son, nobody else will, right? So I think there's always a way. And I can attest it to Ditya. I mean, I think this is part of God's plan, right? I mean, think about it. You, you took your first SAT in October. Yeah. October. Your subject test Not in recommended. November. Right. In November. And you submit your application in December. So yeah. people who try to sign up their kids way way ahead of time you know they have plenty of time if aditya well, can and, it, and let's yeah. talk about aditya for a second because he doesn't and was told by consultants he didn't have the resume yeah. harvard gave him a likely letter they admitted him three weeks before they actually admitted okay. it and mit did too so on the one hand they, those other consultants were totally wrong on the one hand they were right aditya because apparently you could only be accepted by schools in cambridge massachusetts just so <laughs> <laughs> Bill, what's our next question? Well, we had uh, uh, just bouncing off of uh, you know, Johnson mentioned it was a, a, a national school. Um, Brian, what what uh, high school curriculum did you uh, follow? Me? Your high school? Yeah, I went for uh, the Cambridge A level. Right, this is Cambridge and Patrick. You were? I went for the IB. IB, right? And so we've had questions: Cambridge curriculum, IB curriculum. Uh, AP curriculum, what have you, uh, which is best. Um, hey, Bob, who usually makes the decision about what curriculum a high school student gets to take? The decision of the high school is the parent's decision, and the universities know that. The performance of the student is what they evaluate. So wherever you're placed, 
they will see you. And um, that kind of comes to a question I just saw about what extent is luck part of the process? This is not a random process. It is not about luck. It is subjective because different people like different things. Some people like country music, some people don't. And your admissions reader is going to look at it from their perspective and their experience. And that's just the way human nature is. The only part of this process that is random or luck actually is which admissions person is assigned to, assigned to Indonesia because that changes every year. And sometimes it's just who they got. And we don't always know who that is. So we try not to focus on what they're looking for because we don't always know who they are. We always focus on the student themselves. What um, makes them tick? And if you put the student out in a way that they can understand the student, that's what works. So please don't think about it as luck. It is subjective. And what's interesting, and Bill taught me this, about subjective analyses is that humans tend to be all or nothing with what we might otherwise consider to be gray. It's either I like you or mm. So internally, when we look at these essays, we read them to each other. And I remember um, about four months ago, five months ago, I read an essay to Airman Hildo. And I said, so what do you think? I like it. Rats, not good enough. So I went back to the student's original work, put more of the student's voice in, tinkered it just a little, and I read it back to him about 45 minutes later. I love her. And he starts rattling off all these reasons. And I'm like, uh, same person. What? So it's not luck. There's an awful lot of competition. It's the caliber of the communication. Notice I don't say the caliber of the essay. It's the caliber of the communication. It's what the admissions person thinks about your student when it's time for them to grade. This is sales and you're the seller, they're the buyer, buyer always wins. So everything we do is based upon what we want them to think, the structure of our essay, the details we put on everything, but the words have to be the students. They gotta be authentic. You know, there's a, uh, that, that is the human side. Uh, we cannot control who's looking at it. If uh, the person reading your essay has a splitting headache, just found out that there's a leak in their roof and had a fight with uh, you know, his wife, uh, you're probably not gonna get somebody in the best mood, uh, which is a segue to a question that's come up a couple of times. How many schools should you apply to? Because if you put all your eggs in one basket and you get that leaky roof guy who uh, you know, is just out $10,000, um, so, how many? I, I, I'm a little afraid to ask uh, how many schools some of you guys actually applied to, um, but uh, we can at least sort of talk about the sweet spot. Yeah, our advice at UCA is 10 plus or minus. Some schools are more robust in what they request. Stanford. Some schools are pretty easy. Ah, you finish your main personal statement, you're fine. So, it's a question of workload. Please, 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 parents, pay attention to this. Your child's gonna get tired. That's just how it works. And if you make them apply to more schools, the odds do go up, but unfortunately, those are the odds of rejection because they get rushed, they get tired, they get distracted, and they don't do their best work. So we say 10 plus or minus, it's usually a little bit more, but pretty much when people try for 20 or more, they don't get the ones they want, they get very few. Patrick, how many do you apply to? If you count UCs as one, I think I apply to either 10 or 11. What about you, Brian? Uh, nine, if you count UC as one. Aditya, how many schools did you apply to? I didn't have the luxury of time, so I focused most of my attention to Harvard and MIT. I also applied to like a, a bunch of other schools, which was, uh, I, I also applied to Princeton, but then I also applied to like, uh, uh, a bunch of schools that didn't require any additional essays like like Tulane or or, or uh, was it Colgate or Kobe so a uh, total of probably like seven or something yeah yeah the essay is tiring I mean I've seen it you know even like you apply to 10 schools that probably it requires a try to write about 13 to 14 essays right Bob I mean it's, it's just it's just ridiculous you know like especially uh, like my daughter for example she's not a writer for her, it's a torture. You know, I, I, I can't understand when she keeps staring at that empty screen trying to get an idea. And, but a lot of time is, 
because you're trying to write something that you, you're not sure to write about, right? But if you know, hey, this is going to be a good story of my life. I have a lot of good memory. I don't think you have any problem writing it. Right. But if, you, if you're scared that it's the essay is going to be bad or it's not going to be fun, then, then it's going to be a long process, you know, for the whole especially in the month of December, you know. And as a parent, my job is also trying to help managing the timeline, right? Again, you know, I know how many schools he's going to apply to, so I know how many ACs he's going to require. But I know I cannot dump 14 ACs all in the month of December because it will not happen. It will not happen, yeah. And I think one important thing to point out there as well is, like, these are 14 final essays. You know, we're not even counting the drafts. And we write many drafts for one yeah. essay. You can write from three to like five drafts, for example. So if you do the multiplication, it's going through three figures, you know, hundreds of essays that you're writing, basically. Patrick, do you remember how many versions you did of the Common App main personal statement by itself? God, I don't fight like somewhere between five and ten, I think. Uh, nineteen. Okay. <laughs> nineteen. <laughs> Apparently. Yeah. We have the record, Patrick. Cannot lie. Yeah, that's wow. Nineteen, and you tried to rewrite it, and I had to yell at you. Yeah, how many did twenty six? Right, Bob. I think one one student 26. did twenty six oh, revisions. I don't even want to go to the painful uh, repetitions mm -hmm. that we go through, but it's a lot of work. A lot of work. Bill, what do we got next? Uh, I've had a few questions about uh, if you're not sure what your passion is or what happens if you do a whole bunch of different activities, how that's going to look to universities, uh, sort of lumping them together. And I know a teacher was fortunate enough to sort of find something you love to do in, in seventh grade, uh, but uh, that's not necessarily, uh, not, not everybody uh, finds their passion, sorry, Bob, uh, on the same schedule. Uh, how, how would you guys think about that? One of the hard things we see, and this typically happens around grade 10, where usually the boys will say, I know I should be doing more, I just don't know what. And it's hard because the world is in front of you and there's so many possibilities. So we typically rec recommend not to look in front of you, but to look behind you at the things you've already enjoyed. And we want to show you how to do them in a qualitative and quantitative way that actually matches the grading scales of the schools. And we have the grading scales. And essentially for extracurriculars, they look for four things. How long you've done it, how well you've done, where you make an impact, don't just catch the ball, throw, and geographically how far. And finally, the one that's mostly lost, is it original? So instead of trying to find something new, let's look at what's already percolating in there and show you some more better ways that hit what they're looking for. And I think that's what our students uh, probably found, am I right? Yeah, no, definitely. So, Bob, is there a difference between passion and hobby? <laughs> no. The difference is inspiration, okay? If you like it, it doesn't feel like work. You're just going to do it harder, better, longer, if you're required to do it. But the universities don't really care if it's a project or if it's writing underground comics. All they care about is you. And to the extent that you think there's a formula that works, that doesn't make you different than anybody else. There's strong cultures, whether it's a religious culture, a national culture, a school culture, and people do the same thing over and over again. They all look alike. Okay. Yes, you should do those things, but you should do what works for you. And that's where as a parent being supportive is really important. So let me ask you this, like Aditya or Patrick or Brian, they, they have a different length of timeline of their project, right? Aditya doing uh, hydrophonics for six years. Patrick, you probably did your uh, Splurina for two years max, right? And Brian's been running only, what, two, three years? Does or, it really make a difference in terms of the length of the project or whatever you're doing? It's just one factor. Um, if it's brilliant, it's brilliant. That's kind of how it works. Um, there is no perfect formula. Uh, for the parents, again, just support the student and for the student. Please understand this. Your parents will help you more than you can ever imagine. I think that every one of you uh, has recognized 
the role that your parents have played. Sometimes it's giving you ideas. Sometimes it's giving you money. Sometimes it's driving you places and sometimes it's just leaving you alone. And so I'm kind of curious about Herman and his daughter, Kelly, because Kelly obviously did very well in this process. And I'm wondering, Herman, what was the magic dust that you used to get your daughter to raise her in the way that she came out this good? Yeah, well, I think uh, Kelly's a uh, self-motivated uh, I mean, uh, We we uh, usually uh, uh, have a discussion, open discussion with, with, with her, and we spend some time together. But uh, uh, what we do is we just encourage her, uh, just do whatever she likes to do. Uh, just continue doing it consistently and uh, be, be dis disciplined on it. And that we will show later on, 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 on the result. But basically we just keep an open space. We don't interfere so much. You know, uh, a couple of months ago, I asked my parents a question because in second grade, the teacher said, we're gonna have elections for class president. My hand shot up. I didn't know what a class president was. And I didn't know why I did it. So I asked my parents, how did you get me to do that? Because I was clueless. And they said, that's easy. You watched us. Mom did these things, dad did these things, and you just copied the idea of doing things. We didn't have to yeah. tell you to do it. You didn't know any better. And so one of the best things a parent can do is be a role model. Take your lives back, be your best, your students will see that. Now, Bill's story of becoming a doer, particularly in the thespian world, uh, started pretty young too, right? I showed up early for Sunday school when I was eight years old and they were doing a little play and so they cast me as Moses. Uh, I then spent the next uh, 20 years of my life engaged in the theater and I don't think I ever had a role as good as Moses again. Uh, but uh, yeah, no, I mean, absolutely. That was just sort of organically uh, of, of, of finding an interest. Uh, and his family was interested in the arts uh, anyway and, and, and encouraging that. Um, but uh, yeah, absolutely. And uh also speaks to some of the questions that people have about majors and careers. Um, my major was English, theater. I even got a graduate degree in theater. What do I do now? I do this work. Uh, you are uh, going to go through so many twists and turns uh, that uh, you know, try, trying to lock it down when you are in 10th grade, 11th grade. Is... By the way, I'll, I'll tell you how I picked my major. When I was in high school, I had one class that I truly hated, government. Hated it. Just hated it, hated it, hated it. So I go off to college and somewhere in the second semester of freshman year, my father calls and he says, you're not gonna sit around the house all summer, you need a summer job. I'm like, okay, but I'm a thousand miles away from our house. I don't know how to do that. He calls me back a week later. Do you remember your first swimming coach when you were six years old? Yeah, he's our lawyer, you're gonna work in a law firm. And that was the moment I became a lawyer. And I went off to law school and hated every moment of it. Did 25 years as a lawyer, hated every moment of it. Why? Because my father told me to do something. I just did it. And I thought that was how you do things. Later in life, I realized a lot of things my parents told me didn't make sense. And I'm wondering from either Herman or from Johnson, do you think it works when the parents tell the kids what to do? Well, uh, I think sometimes, especially for Asian, you know, um, to me, the way I was raised is parents know better, right? And I, at the same time, you cannot let your kids to go all over, right? You get, you gotta keep them focused. With their kids. Uh, yeah, I mean, one thing that we try to do with our kids is let just let them find what they like, right? If if you think it fits them well, and then you support it. For example, like uh, both my kids play violins, and I don't play any music, right? But when I see they are enjoying, and I have to, I have to support them even more, even though you know. They're not gonna have a career in music, but they like it. Sometimes it's good for them to, like a hobby or to relieve their stress from school. But there are many times uh, when I, let's say I want my, my, my son to do Taekwondo, right? Because I want him to be like me. And then he didn't enjoy it. But then one day he said, you know what? I wanna go back to Taekwondo. And then you, you know, let's do it, you know? Um, so I think our, our job is identify, right? And help their kids to be a better person. Um, there are many parents that try to do it too much. They, they just overkill it. And at the end of the day is, it's gonna burn out the kids. 
and then they, they, there won't be any results. But there are, many, there, are, there are also parents that don't have time. They just don't care. And then the kids have to find on their own, which may or may not become a successful thing to do. You know? So I think, I think it could both ways, Bob. We have uh, some friends who are Chinese and Malaysian, et cetera, all over the world. And their, their kids have done very well, gotten into great colleges, and they're shocked. But I didn't do anything. Exactly. So Herman, were you a tiger dad? No, actually, I'm not at all. Uh, uh, my kids doesn't like to be told. Uh, yes, de definitely. Uh, so what we do is that we just show by example, and then let, let her stumble. And when when she got a problem, she will come back to us and and tell us about her problem. Then we we just talk talk it uh, take it over and then uh, try to solve it. So basically, she want to be her, her on her own. Then and and we're okay with that. And I think it, it's fine as long as uh, she's doing something right. I mean, uh, something that her, uh, she can learn. You know, yeah. We have a few yeah. questions about interviews. Sorry. Yeah, I was going to say let's let, let let's talk about some interview stuff. A uh, question came up about uh, will interviews be affected by COVID? Uh, probably, but who knows? Uh, things change really really quickly. I'm pretty sure that we're going to have to revisit. Uh, our advice on how to give good handshakes because I won't be allowed to act on uh, at, at that point. Uh, but uh, yeah, people do want to know, uh, Aditya, Patrick, uh, Brian, did you go through the interview process? What did you, uh, what, what, what did you find in, in the course of going through that? I had the most experience. I went to, I went through three cycles of admission, so I experienced a lot of interviewers. Um, my first year interview went really well. Um, I think Bob, um, prepared me a lot for it. Um, I think, I think that a lot of the, um, I think a lot of, like, like we said, a lot of the US admissions process is very different from the UK admissions process. Um, the first time I talked to Bob, I asked him, should I call you Mr. Levine? Or should I call you Mr. Robert? He said, no, just Bob. I think that kind of exemplifies the culture in the US wherein uh, a lot of the interviewers are not out to get you, they're out to help you. Um, so I think that with that mindset, and with that mindset, um, I did really well. Um, my second interview, I didn't do so well, but then my third round of interviews, I did pretty well as well. So I think that um, a lot of the admissions officers, um, a lot of the people interviewing, they um, went to their schools and they're doing it um, as a service to their school, for, uh, to their alma mater, um, because they want to find the best people out there. So I think that they're advocates for you. I think, Bob, you interviewed for 29 years, you can testify. It was 29 years, yeah. Um, Patrick, it had a long interview for Stanford, wasn't yeah. it? How long was your Stanford interview? I think it was like two and a half hours, almost three hours, and it was supposed to be a 45 minute interview. Right. So, a lot of times, you know, people think about these college interviews as technical interviews for some reason. You know, a lot of people think that, oh, they're super scared to go to these interviews because they're going to ask you something about math. Like they're going to ask you like a math problem, you know? And while that might be true, maybe in, for example, the UK, with the US interviews, they're really just trying to know more about you. You know, so when you're in these interviews and why my interview went for so long, you know, because me and my interviewer kind of bonded through tennis, you know, I've been playing, I think at that time, tennis for 15 years of my life um, when I met my interviewer and we both had interestingly very different favorite players, you know, he liked Nadal, I love Federer and we were just kind of bonding through the reasons why we liked each other and outside the reasons why we liked our favorite players and um, why we respect each other's players. And so in these interviews, you know, it's super casual. You're really just talking about you. They're going to ask questions about, you know, what did you enjoy? What did you do in high school? Like, why did you like it? You know, and it comes further than just, you know, question and answer kind of thing. It becomes really a conversation where it's just really at the end of the day, like kind of a coffee chat, basically. And they're fun. Uh, people think of it as interrogation or like a UK or a job interview. Mm -hmm. uh, the truth is they just want to find somebody they like and the interviewers generally don't know anything about you. So while you're worrying about the questions, you should be worrying about the answers because you're the only one who has the information to t discuss. They're not going to quiz you. They're going to ask you about you and they don't know anything. You are actually in charge. Now there will be interviews. We suspect they will be more and more online, but we're pretty used to online. Um, Aditi, what about your interviews? I did like around four interviews. Three of them were, were online, and one of them was in person in a, in a, in a local Starbucks. Uh, oh. uh, yeah. So 
I first thought an interview was like this daunting task or daunting hurdle or challenge, but I found like from, from the entire application process, the interview process was, was, was the most enjoyable out of all. Because, you know, after some, uh, a great amount of preparation, you, you, you know, you, you know what, the, what the interviewer's job is, you know, what, what questions they are probably going to ask. So like the first question they, they usually ask is, uh, tell me about yourself. Because like Bob said, they don't know anything about you. They don't know anything about your extracurricular as who you are, what, uh, you know, what environment you grew up in. So basically, we'll, by uh, answering that question, you can take control of the conversation. You know, because the, uh, the interview doesn't have your resume. You can uh, p uh, handpick some of the activities or some of the points that you want to, uh, you're, you're most proud of out of your uh, resume and then present it to the interviewer, like three or four points. And then uh, from, from that action, you can take control of the conversation, you know, guide the interviewer to your resume and to your activities. So, you know, after some, uh, a great deal of preparation, I found the, uh, the interviewer quite, quite, very, very enjoyable because they were all very uh, comfortable. They were all very engaging uh, and very kind to me. So, yeah. You know, there's this movie called The Perfect Date on Netflix, um, where the guy interviews for Yale um, and he comes up with a very obscure topic. Please don't do that. I mean, um, you don't know anything about an interviewer. I think that um, every time I come up with, I come to an interview, I always find um, something in common with the interview. The last time was, my last Georgetown interview was about freaking fire miles and about hacking the system. Um, so it, 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 every you time I end an interview- he's the king of that, right? You do know Johnson is the Yeah, best. yeah, I talked to Johnson. I had a bit of experience and then, you know, this guy came in, he challenged a lot of Johnson's ideas. I, I, I should in interview for college right now, Bob. I have a lot of <laughs> stories to tell. You have a lot well, of yeah, stories. But I, I think, I think uh, back to uh, the comments, I, we work with over, I mean, myself, we over like 100 students from Indonesia. There is no single of them that did not enjoy the interview. Right. They, they think that interview is their chance to showcase, right? I need to show you more from what I use on the paper because, you know, they, they spend so much time writing this essay, but they're so afraid, like maybe I need to tell them more about myself, right? And then it's different when you can tell in person, you know? And like two, two and a half hours interview, that's a long time, Patrick. I think- yeah, The record is, by the way, we have two guys, two hours and 45 minutes. Yeah. Wow. You were close, so, Patrick. Yeah, close enough. You know, I one, one thing you, I did interview for, for, for years for Princeton, and uh, I can't tell you how many times, I, I always wanted to give my students about 20 to 25 minutes at least. Uh, you know, they, they, they took the trouble to meet me, it wasn't a Starbucks, it was a Panera, uh, but they, they took the trouble to, to, to meet with me, uh, I wanted to give them that time. I can't tell you how many times it was like pulling teeth because the students went in there just not really prepared and giving one word answers. Um, if you can go in there and have something interesting to say, I'm no longer worried about can I make it 20 to 25 minutes. I'm suddenly there at an hour 15 going, actually, the university now officially caps that we're not allowed to go over an hour. Um, but, uh, you know. And I, yet I, we still do, isn't it? And yet we still do. And I'm, 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 I'm sitting there, you know, sort of saying, well, I'm supposed to pick my daughter up from dance class. And that's the situation you want your interviewer to be in. Uh, is, is and, and Bill, I don't, think it doesn't, I don't think it doesn't matter whether you're introvert or extrovert. I mean, it doesn't affect the interview. Because if you know what you're going to tell, right, exactly. you can spend two hours just talking. Nothing time. makes me more insane as a former interviewer to go into an interview and get this kind of thing. Do you like music? Oh, I love music. What kind of music? All kinds. Like what? Um, any specific artists or bands? Uh, it's in your phone. You should know this. <laughs> the things you will discuss are yours. So, but I want to shift over a little bit to the experience side of our, of our two college students. And a question was raised, is time management difficult? <laughs> uh, confess. Oh, um, God. I, I was very, sorry, Patrick, you can go. No, you go first, you go first. Yeah, I, I um, honestly at college, um, I, I had pretty good time management, Bob, you can attest. But um, after I started applying to um, Haas, you knew that um, time management slipped. So I think that a lot of the opportunities in college um, kind of contributed to that, but that's just, um, but you know, I, I, I try my best, but sometimes these deadlines slip. Um, yeah, and that's okay. Yeah. 
my time time management before college honestly apps so bad so bad like i would sleep two hours a day like because i was just like procrastinating all the time but one thing i have to say it's like when you come to college you know there's so many things to think about. You're not only thinking about your studies, you know, you're, you're literally living by yourself. And I feel like in high school, I was very sheltered in a sense where all my courses were chosen, you know, like I just had to show up in school seven to 3 PM every single day, you know, and just work with that. And when I went to college, it was a very big difference because now I'm picking my own courses I'm planning my four years, you know, I'm choosing my major, I'm washing my clothes as much as much as that sounds very privileged of me, you know, and that's where time management becomes a very big thing. So although your time management, time management, first of all, is probably one of the most important factors in college to succeed. And I feel like a lot of times you know, earlier in my early stages of college, I think freshman year, I had a very hard time with struggling with that. But I think one thing that's important is there's so many little things that we can do to improve it. Like for example, writing post-it notes, you know, prioritizing different things, you know, not playing League of Legends, too long you know these are small things that we can change so just because you think your time management isn't great you can always constantly improve on them it's more of just like do you want to or let, let me be clear a couple years ago we asked our students what's the number one adjustment to college and 98 percent of them said time management just all, it you go from having no time to manage to having all the time in the world to manage but even in high school time management's a problem this is where we want our students to to reach out to us You've never been through high school before and you start to do things in a weird order. Like the guy who just is not good at foreign language is getting a, a failing grade in Spanish. And when I finally asked him, when does he study Spanish? His answer was last. What time is last? 1130 at night. No, really, tell me the truth. 1230. So you think that studying the one thing you cannot physically or mentally do after midnight is gonna work? So I just said, look, do it first before you even take a break, come home, do your Spanish. He you started getting perfect grades and two more hours of sleep. So there are some adjustments. Certainly in college, you have to adjust. It's a problem in high school too. Um, and for the young people who are listening in, please, if you wanna be an adult, you have to act like an adult. The difference is uh, as adults, when we have a problem, we ask for help. We kind of con you into believing everybody's perfect. Or you have to be perfect, but nobody's perfect. If you feel anything slip, ask for help. As adults, as parents, we will be thrilled that you ask for our advice and we will be very happy that you're mature enough to ask the question. We're not gonna get mad at you. We'll get mad at you if you try to do it yourself, struggle and screw up. So use us as a resource, not as the enemy. We have a little bit more time. They'll probably want more, two more questions. What's up? Yeah, uh, I guess a, a couple of questions about um, is it ever too late to start? Uh, I'm interested in the sciences and I don't have uh, all sorts of awards. Am I at a disadvantage? Um, uh, I, I mentioned earlier that the uh, most common answer in college uh, admissions consulting is it depends. Um, but uh, I wonder if anybody else uh, has this sort of thoughts. That, uh, well, this is kind of the difference between the UK style and the American style. We certainly do have programs where you start engineering or Wharton business right away. And in those situations, they're gonna be looking at your experience because you're starting right away. But they're not looking at you as a chemistry person who has to have chemistry. They're looking for you as a person. You're going to be trained. They don't expect you to know everything and they don't expect you to have done anything. So to the extent that your resume is not as robust as you wish, please don't worry. They're really looking for you as a person and they're choosing whom they wish to train. At the same time, that's what a consultant can help you with. How to make adjustments, even at the very last minute. Uh, we had a guy named Matt, who was a US football player. And he decided before his last year, he's gonna quit. And I said, Matt, I'm proud of you. You're not gonna be a football player and it's taking too much time. It's making you nuts. I'm glad you quit, but you can't quit. You don't just give up, you move to something better. So what's the something better? And we had to talk for a while, but ultimately he knew that he liked finance and business and he really knew that he liked art. So during his last year of high school, he did a, a project, if you will, with a friend to create an art exhibit for 20 high school students at 20 different local high schools. And they raised $7,000 for charity. And Matt's thing was that he realized he wanted to use his monetary finance business abilities to spread public art. 
And USC agreed with them and gave him a $100,000 scholarship. And right now, yesterday, I was talking to him about what he's doing now that he's graduated. They've put together, uh, they're putting together now a database of museum work, virtual art exhibits, and all around the world. And he's using his understanding of business and his love of art to merge. None of that, except he had taken one art history course, none of that was on his radar starting at the end of his 11th grade. So if you're going into the admission cycle right now, it's still not too late. However, you might want to get started now. Uh, yeah, exactly. so it is wonderful for us to uh, be able to have people here from Harvard, from Stanford, from Berkeley. Um, we track, what, 250 plus schools? Um, it, the U.S. has a breadth of educational opportunities that really is unrivaled anywhere else in the world. Um, we, we, we have issues with all sorts of things, COVID cases are spiking, uh, but our university system really is second to none, and the opportunities that are out there, whatever your, uh, whatever your interests um, are. And please look away from the top 10 or top 20. Look, this is an industry. It's an education industry, still an industry. So a lot of what you hear is based upon the international ideal, for example, in China, where the government gets the number one money and professors to the number one school, and only the students who test best get that in two and three. It's not how it works here. Uh, but what, how it does work here is the idea of rankings. Now, in the US, US News is king. For any of you who ever heard of the really good public university in Seattle called University of Washington, often called UW, and you've heard of US News rankings, the king. Well, there are actually multiple rankings. I'm just going to talk about two. There is a national ranking, which is just the U.S. schools against the U.S. schools. And there's a global ranking, which is everybody in the world ranked. In the U.S. alone, the national ranking, UW is ranked number 62. You can go ahead and look it up, number 62. I think they're a little better, but let's just say 62. Fine. In the global ranking, the same company, U.S. News, ranks the same university, UW, as number 10 in the world. How does that happen? Because they use a formula and the formula different. UW's in Seattle, it's on the Pacific Ocean, it's near Asia, and they're trying to impress you. So you're hearing a lot of things. There are quite literally 100 schools that are just as good as Harvard or Stanford or Berkeley for the right student. So open your mind. There's a lot of stuff out there. And there, this is one of the best parts about the US, not only the quantity, but the diversity in the way we deliver education. It's not one size fits all. There's, um, there's a pretty interesting article um, that I can put in, in the chat where in Northeastern University, um, they try to game the rankings um, from below 100 to above 100. So manipulating the rankings is in the books for a lot of these colleges these days. In fact, Northeastern went from number 167 in US News to number 37. Uh, the, the last question we're going to answer today, it's, it's almost too perfectly queued up. Uh, is UCA open for registration? Yes, of course. We work with uh, students, uh, as I mentioned earlier, around the world uh, at every possible level uh, as well. Um, we uh, we uh, will be including information in the follow-up email here about how you can sign up for a free consultation with one of our client managers. Uh, I'd like to learn a little bit more. Um, I think Johnson will also be doing some follow-up as well. Uh, so uh, we are here to help. We definitely want to be here to help. Uh, and uh, thank you to the person who posed that question. It was almost uh, too perfect. Uh, too perfect. Uh, 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 set up there. But, but um, Bill, um, we work with many students, but at the end of the day, is the relationship is what makes a difference between us, you know, me, Bob, you, with the students, right? I mean, Brian will text me like two o'clock in the morning, even though he knows I'm, I'm in the East Coast, right? And say, hey, you wanna talk? And I will say, sure, right? Because I'm still up. Um, you know, we, I, I, I probably know him more than any other students because you know, the relationships keep going, you know, like um, going through certain classes, you know, like, should I take this class? Should I take that class? We, we can talk. You know, but if you don't do that, it will never happen, right? I mean, the relationship is it's, it's, it's two-way street, right? Uh, people think it's, the relationship is done after you submit an application, you get a result, and that's it. No, it's, it's keep going. 
like Bob and Patrick talk a lot, right? And we're hoping uh, Aditya, you know, we always here for you. Um, you can ask any questions, any advice. Um, we're here as friends forever. We definitely believe in community. Um, I was really excited about today's presentation. It's the first time we've done a town hall. We're going to do these three or four times a year just for Indonesia alone. So uh, watch for those other opportunities. But if you do have other questions, you know how to find us and we'll have follow-up email. We want your questions answered because we're doing this. Well, I'll tell you why. Johnson said, hey, look, I'm from Jakarta. I think UCA can help in Indonesia. Do you want to try? We wouldn't be in Indonesia unless Johnson cared about his homeland. And I think that what you're seeing, I hope, what you're seeing mostly today is how um, this is about relationships. This is about community. We help our young students with what they need. We help our adults with what they need. And sometimes we'll ask for help. It's, it's easier to go through the valley of shadow of death with friends. And I'm very pleased that Herman and Johnson and Brian and Patrick and Aditya were able to join us today because it means a lot, not just for the audience, but to me personally. Uh, this is important stuff. And to all of our panelists, as well as our audience, I'd really like to say thank you for all your efforts today. All right. Perfect. Thank if you, you like all. To more about uh, us. The, the yep. recording will be posted. Uh, and uh, of course, if you have follow up questions uh, af after this, uh, as Bob mentioned, we're always uh, here to answer your questions and, and eager to do so. So thank you. Until we can get back to Indonesia. Signing off for today, but please keep in touch and we will be back. I can't wait to see you all in person. And uh, again, thank you for your interest and for helping our next generation. And stay safe. Definitely. Good night, everybody. And if you get a chance, use the MRT. The government paid for that and you probably should use it when you can. Wear a mask, please. See you soon. <laughs> I'll see you all. Bye.